name is Stephanie, and I'm so glad you decided to join us on YouTube today. We have an exciting message for you today, so make sure that you're engaged, leaned in, and taking notes. Also, be sure to like and share this video, and if you haven't yet, be sure to turn on notifications and subscribe so you can stay up to date with everything happening on our YouTube channel. Now let's jump into the sermon. I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to go to the book of Ruth. Go to the book of Ruth. Now, if you got the tree version this morning, it may take you, it always, it takes me a little while to find Ruth. It's just one of those books that I can't find, but it's right after Joshua and Judges and all in that neighborhood. But I want you to turn to the book of Ruth as we continue our series called One. Each week, we're focusing on one idea. We are focusing on one scripture or one phrase that will kind of be like our anchor or the light at the end of the path for 2023. How often do we give in to the temptation, especially with the new year, do we give in to the temptation and we want to change many things? It's like we make this list of 10 things that we want to change, 10 things we want to change about us, 10 things we want to change about maybe our spouse or kids or kids would like to change about their parents, okay? How about that? But instead of focusing on many things, we're going to focus on one thing. So my hope is, and I hope that you're getting something out of this series, because I'm not sure when it's going to end, because in a couple of weeks, I'm going to preach on contentment. I'm really excited about that. But um, anyway, we're just going to keep going with this for a little while, so I hope you get something out of it. I hope that you're going to gravitate to one of the, you're going to just latch on to one of these thoughts that we're having in this series. And that, again, that's going to be your anchor. It's what's going to pull, push you through the year. We've been talking about living a life beyond us. We talked about fear. We talked about worship. We talked about not being offended. If you've not heard that sermon, you need to go watch that online. Obedience last week. And today, our one idea is healthy relationships. Now, I know what some of you are thinking like, well, pastor, I'm single and not married. Well, good, because now is when you need to learn about healthy relationships and not after you get married. Wouldn't it be great for a doctor to go to medical school before he performs surgery on you? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Well, this is going to be really good, and not just for people who are married, but single people. And this, this can be applied to every relationship in your life. But today, we're going to talk about healthy relationships. After all, it's February, and love is in the air. Love should be in the air. I mean, when you think about February and Valentine's Day, who doesn't like chocolate? If you don't, don't even tell me. I could never look at you the same again. And I was so grateful the day that I read that dark chocolate is healthy for you. And so now I try to, at least once a day, to have a bite of just dark, dark chocolate. So it's healthy. Chocolate, flowers. Everybody likes flowers except Christy. I just want you to know, your pastor's wife does not like flowers, but most people love flowers. Think about it. It's time away from your kids at least one night, one meal, not out at the movies, going for a walk, holding hands, attending the EXO marriage conference, or just going out and having a quiet dinner. All of that sounds good, but the truth is many of us, we're struggling in our relationships. Now, don't you look at me for a moment because I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been together, whatever. I want you to know in every relationship, there is struggle. In every relationship, husband, wife, kids, parents, parents, kids, boss, employee, all of that. In every relationship, there are going to be struggles. I've heard a lot of people over the years, and I'm old enough now, I've been in this business for a long time, I've heard a lot of people say to me, talking about couples, they have, said, they have said this, I love him, I love her, but I'm no longer in love with them. I've heard that a lot. Like, I love them, like I don't want anything bad to happen, but I'm no longer in love. I just want you to know this love thing, it starts out easy. And it's just, it's all cool and romantic and attractive and all that kind of stuff. But after you get married and make that commitment, you got to go to work. 
And you've got to be intentional if you're going to have a healthy relationship. So today, all healthy relationships, all relationships can be complicated and even messy. In the best of times, there will be complications, difficulties, unexpected and unplanned moments. Am I encouraging anybody right now? I'm just going to tell you, there's going to be unexpected and there are going to be unplanned moments in every relationship. All of us will say or think at one point, this is not what I planned, dreamed, or expected. For some of you, maybe your dream relationship has turned into a nightmare. Well, you're not alone because the story that we're going to look at today, the story of Ruth, is an incredible story. So I think there are four, if I got this right, I think there are four chapters to this story. It is a great book. And if you wanted something to read, you go read this. Now, if you like sad endings and all that kind of stuff, then you probably don't need to read this book. This is a great story. What an ending. Now, this story, it starts out, it has some difficult and unexpected moments and years, years of, of just unexpected and difficult and even sad moments, but what an ending that it has. I want to set the backdrop for you this morning where we can put this in context. Are you guys ready this morning? Are you ready? Because the 830, they just, they're, they're never awake. They just look at me. And so I don't know when I get to you, I don't know if it's a bad sermon, bad presentation, or they're asleep. So you guys, you're the hinge, okay? You, you're the one that's going to either, I'm either going to come back for the 1130 or I'm just going to go home, okay? <laughs> so no pressure at all. <clears throat> I'm going to set the backdrop. Ruth lived <clears throat> in extreme corrupt times known as the time of the judges. Now, the time of the judges served, it was kind of a segue, it was a bridge from the leadership of Joshua. Remember, Moses died. Joshua takes over. He leads for a period of time. And from Joshua until Saul, we talked about this last week, Saul became the first king of Israel. So in that gap was the time known as the judges. And the judges were the ones who were the rulers for the people of Israel. Some of the darkest days of Israel's history. Society had become a cesspool of moral corruption and injustice. Families were literally gripped by sinful, evil spirit of lying, stealing, greed, division, sexual perversion, violence. And on top of that, there was a severe famine or recession in the land. Judges 17 and verse 6 describes it this way. In those days, Israel had no king. And all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Does any of this sound familiar, by the way? Does it kind of parallel to the times in which we are living in today with all of the craziness that's going on in our world? That was their culture. That was the time in which Ruth and her husband got married and said, Hey, we're going to start out and we're going to build a life and build a family together. But like many families, I'm sure they dreamed of kids growing up and growing older together. It's like all married couples. We start out with this dream in mind that we're going to grow old together and we're going to raise our kids and our grandkids and we are going to have this dream life. You know, I heard this about grandkids. <clears throat> we're not there yet, thank God. But <clears throat> I heard this about grandkids. Somebody told me one time that grandkids are, the re are God's reward for you not killing your own kids. <laughs> Isn't that great? So it gives you something to look forward to, okay? <clears throat> but like many relationships, things did not turn out the way they planned. Not in this story, but this relationship. And, there, and this, story, this story is about relationship. And there's a key person that I'm not going to talk a lot about today, but Naomi is a key figure in this story. I just don't have time to unpack all this because y'all leave. And so, but there's, it's a key deal, but the relationship between Naomi and Ruth, but I'm really going to focus on Ruth today and, and her relationships in this. So let's get started. Y'all ready for this? So this relationship, the one I'm going to talk to you about in every relationship in your life, it's in your notes. Number one, we'll have disappointments. Just let that say, I'm, I'm going to encourage you. We're going to get 
better, but we got to start out. We got to go through some tough stuff to get to the good stuff. Are y'all ready for this? Okay. <clears throat> Ruth chapter one, begin reading in verse one. So it's in your notes. Every relationship will have disappointment. I don't care how good it is. Every relationship will have disappointment. Here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 1, in the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem, I want you to circle Bethlehem, that is a, that's, that's going to be a little nugget, Bethlehem in Judah, left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. Verse 2 says, this man was Elimelech and his wife was Naomi. They had two sons and their sons were Malan and Kilian and they were Ephratites from Bethlehem, watch this, in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. So they went to Moab because they had heard, okay, things are better in northwest Arkansas. So if you'll move over there, it's just a little bit better there. And then Elimelech died. Watch this. He died. Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons get married. And so one of the sons married Ruth, who is the key person in this story, but about 10 years later, both sons, both husbands died. This left Naomi alone with her two sons or her husband. Now, you talking about, there's not even a warm-up. There's not even an introduction to this story. It just starts here and goes there at the drop of a hat. I mean, it just gets worse and worse. There's a famine. They have to move away. The husband dies. Later, the, the sons die. It's just a sad, sad story. So my point is, in every story, in every relationship, there will be disappointment. So right out of the gate, the unimaginable, the unexpected happened. Ruth never dreamed that she would be a widow at such a young age. I want you to think about this. She was living in a foreign land, meaning she didn't have the comfort of her family and her friends, her connect group. She lived in a male-dominated society, grieving the loss of her husband, and she had absolutely no income. How was she going to make it? How was she going to pay her bills? How was she going to survive? Because there was no government assistance in those days, so there was no help. So a woman was totally dependent on her husband, and so for some reason or any reason, he passed away. Or he decided, I don't want to live with you anymore and file for a divorce. She was literally at the mercy of her family and people in her community to make a living because women were not allowed to have an education, not allowed to work. So she was totally dependent upon this guy who now has passed away. And now she's left holding the bag, wondering, how am I going to make it? How am I going to get through this time of my life? Everything and everyone who was familiar was gone. At this point of her story, she was destined to not only to live alone, but to live in poverty. She was now at the mercy of the generosity of other people for her survival. Even though Ruth was still young, her life had been filled with one disappointment after another. Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, she even thinks and says later on in this story that God has forsaken us, that God has abandoned us. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been in a moment or a season in your life? In a, it, maybe it's in finances or health or relationship. You just feel like God has abandoned me and God has let me down. He's, he's forgot all about me. Maybe you're today, you're not where you expected your relationship to be at this point in your life. This was not part of your dream life. Like when you started out in your relationship, you're like, here's the picture of what this is going to look like. It's like if you're a guy, you know, like I had this dream that, you know, that I, when Chris and I got married, I had this dream that I was going to come home. And the music would start like the king is home. And there would be a, like a, a bottle of water handed to me and all of that. And dinner would be ready, hot and all. And, all, and then all of a sudden, that's like a dream. That's your picture of what this is going to look like. And then there's reality. Yes. And oftentimes, the picture that you have in your mind and reality are not one and the same. And that's when we have conflict. 
is when the picture that we have in our mind of what this is going to be, what we want it to be, what it should be, what it could be, and now, what, Lord, what, what happened? This is not way, this is not what I was expecting. This is not what I signed up for. And maybe that's where you are today, and you're in this part, in this place in your life, and you're like, this is not what I signed up for. Maybe your kids are a hot mess. Your, your marriage is struggling at best. What started out as a well-thought-out plan and a dream has turned into anything but a dream. You find yourself in a place where your prince has turned into a frog. Some of y'all get that later. And you only hope Sleeping Beauty does not wake up. <laughs> Life is filled with disappointments. Life is filled with disappointments. Watch this. And they're not always your fault. Sometimes they are, but they're not always your fault. You can do everything right in life, and it can still turn out wrong. Read the book of Job. You can do everything right in your relationship, and it can still lead to disappointment and disappointing seasons. But your story is not finished. Why? Because God is still in the process of writing on your pages in your story. So it may be a disappointing page or a chapter in your life, but it's not the last chapter of your life because God and only God has editorial rights over your life. He's the one who writes the last chapter of your life. So God has a way of turning your disappointments and discouragements into a better and brighter life than what you could have ever imagined because we are limited with our finite thing, We're just limited with our thinking. And the best life that you could ever dream of does not compare to the life that God has planned for you. You may be disappointed, but you're not dead. I said you may be disappointed, but you're not dead. Your relationship may be in a, in a, in a difficult or a disappointing season, but it doesn't mean that it's dead and God is not finished because I believe God's not finished with us. That great line, if you're not dead, God's not done. If you're not dead, God's not done. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, I mean chapter 4, verse 8, he says, We are pressed on every side by troubles. How many of you know that? We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. Verse 9, I want you to watch this. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. The word abandoned means to be left helpless. That we are never, watch this, that's an absolutely, that's an absolute. We are never abandoned. We are never left helpless by God. He never promises in his word that he will always speak to you. He does not always say that he's going to explain things in a way that you're going to understand them, that in a way that you're going to accept them and be okay. But he did say, I'm not ever going to leave you, and I'm not ever going to abandon. I will never leave you helpless. That's a promise from God. He is not going to leave us helpless. Every relationship has disappointments. Number two, every relationship has a decision point. Every relationship has a decision point. There were some critical decisions that Ruth made that changed the trajectory of her story. For starters, Ruth's other sister-in-law, who also had lost her husband, was returning home with Naomi. Ruth's mother-in-law was encouraging Ruth to return with her. Now I want you to watch this decision point. It's Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. But Ruth replied, now I want you to pick up the tone of her reply. She says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, wherever you live, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Let's just pause and everybody go, wow. Would you say wow a little bit louder? Wow. wow. Thank you so much. We are a spirit-filled church here. Okay. Wow. It's just, it's, it's a decision point 
And notice the level of commitment. This intersection was a critical decision point for Ruth. Now, I'm sure the easy thing would have been, I'm going to go with my sister-in-law. We're going to return back to our family and our friends. I'm going to have support group there. Northwest Church will be there. My connect group will be there. But Ruth was not indecisive. She was committed until death to Naomi and to God. Every relationship will bring you to an intersection where you have to decide, I'm either going to stay in this car and I'm going to keep going, or I'm going to get out and I'm going to walk by myself. Every relationship will bring you to that point. I'm going to really encourage you today. It's going to be more than one decision point. And it's going to be more than one intersection. It's going to be more than just one season in your life. There are going to be many moments. There are going to be many intersections in your life, in your relationships, all relationships, that you have to make a decision, am I going to stay in or am I going to get out? It's going to be that way with jobs. It's that way with your church. It's that way in your relationship with your kids. You're going to have to make a decision. I'm either going to stay in or I am going to get out. My point is, every decision, every relationship has decision points, and they are very, very important. Now, this decision will determine how your story ends. Your decision to stay in or get out will determine how your story ends. You're trying to decide, maybe some of you right now, am I going to go back or am I going to keep going? There are times, there are times in which it may be best to end a relationship. I'm not saying never. I, I, I believe that. There are times that the best thing is to end a relationship. But not always. You may not like, most often it is best to keep going. Not all times, but most of the time, the best decision you can make in a relationship is I'm in it, and I'm going to stay in it, and I'm going to finish this, what God has started, I'm going to help finish. You may not like where you are at right now, you may not like where you are, but sometimes you have to go through where you are in order to get where God wants you to get. Most of the time, none of us, we don't, like, we don't always like where we are, but the only way you're going to get beyond where you are is you got to go through where you are, and a lot of people get out where you are moments. They get out and go, this is not what I signed up for, this is not this is messy. I'm going to have to change. I'm going to have to grow. I'm going to have to mature. And they don't like where they are. And so today, people, when they don't like where they are, they get out. They don't like church. Okay. They just get out and go to another church. They don't like a job. So they just get out of that job, go to another job. That carries over in our relationships. We don't like this relationship. Okay. We just get out of this relationship, we move on to another relationship. What I'm saying is sometimes you have to go through some tough stuff in order to get to the good stuff. And the reason a lot of us never experience the good stuff is because we're not willing to go through the tough stuff. That's good preaching, Pastor Joe. Y'all sound like 830 right now, I'm just telling y'all. You're not helping me. Ruth made a decision. She said, I'm going to stay with Naomi and I'm going to keep going. Maybe today, at this moment, you're not in a good place with your kids, your coworker, your friend, family member, family member, <laughs> family member, <laughs> family member, <laughs> or even your spouse. But you, <laughs> you're at a decision point. It is critical. And I say when you're at those decision points and you're at those intersections, take a deep breath, get alone with God before you make a life-altering decision. So many people make life-altering decisions when they are emotional, like a train wreck. I think it was Dr. Robert Schuller. It had to be because I said it in the 830. Nobody corrected me. And if I made a mistake, somebody would send me you. Anyway, Dr. Robert Schuller said, never make a decision when you're in a valley. Because when you make a decision in the valley... You're only going to go from one valley to another valley. It's a different valley, but it's still a valley. So a lot of people say, well, I'm going to leave this relationship and go to another relationship. Well, if this one stinks, there's a good chance when you get to the next one, it's going to stink as well. You leave this job and go to another job in the valley, that's what happens. 
But most people make these life-altering decisions when they're emotional. So just this is free stuff from Pastor Joe. Whether it's positive emotion or negative emotion, don't make a decision. Don't make a life-altering decision when you're low or when you're high. Why? Because it's going to alter that decision, and that decision is going to determine the trajectory of your life for months or years to come. So you got to settle the emotions down. I get it. It's tough. It stinks sometimes. You don't want to be where you are, but every time I get in one of those seasons of my life, I don't like where I am. I just make up my mind. I got to keep going because the only way I'm going to get where I'm going to get is I got to keep going through what I'm going through right now. You just got to keep moving till you get to the other side. You're at a decision point. Let me, let me give you something. Can I just preach for a moment? I feel good. Y'all don't help me, but I'm, 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 I'm all right. If you look at me for a moment, please. If you can't work it out with this person, what makes you think you can work it out with another person? And part of the issue is you. Or some of it is. Maybe a lot of it. Maybe all of it. I don't know. I'm just saying, if you can't work out a conflict with this person, what makes you think you can work it out with another person? If you can't work out a conflict at this job, what makes you think you can work it out at another job? If you can't work out a, a disagreement or disappointment in this church, I know you would never be disappointed in me. <laughs> I can't even say that without laughing. Or, this, or Northwest Church. I'm just trying to say, if you can't work it out here, what makes you think you're going to work it out in another church? I tell people all the time, you've got to learn to work some stuff out. If not, you're just going to be changing people and changing churches and jobs your whole life. And you're going to get an end of your life and look back going, I had a lot of dumb people in my life. In which I want to say, what's the common denominator? Well, I'm encouraging today, aren't I? I'll watch Andy Stanley. He encourages you. I shouldn't have said that. shouldn't have said that. My whole point is, you got to learn to work this stuff out. If you love someone, I'm going to show you this. Now, I don't counsel anymore, and there's lots of reasons. I'll give you some of them. The reason I don't counsel anymore, I listen to people, you know, if they want me to listen to them. But I, I, I don't counsel anymore. Because number one, I learned people don't give me all the pieces to the puzzle. No, they don't tell you all the stuff. So i got to put together a puzzle, and I don't have all the pieces. You just can't do it. Number two... They don't do a dadgum thing I tell them to do. I can't say dadgum. They don't do anything that I tell them to do, okay? And number three, they get mad at me. Yeah, they get mad at me because I didn't fix what they didn't tell me and what they wouldn't do that I told them. But they get mad at Pastor Joe and blame Pastor Joe for their mess. And on top of that, they've been fighting for 20 years and want me to fix it in 20 minutes. So I just, I just, I don't do it anymore. But when I did do it, <laughs> I'd always start with this. D do you, Lisa, do you love me? Yes. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> that would have really been awkward. <laughs> that would have been really awkward today if she would have said no or maybe or hesitated. Thank you, Lisa. But if you love that person, then there's hope. That's the key. If you love that person, there's hope. But when you no longer love that person, boy, it's, 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 it's hard to make people love each other. Yeah. Like Ruth, you've gone too far to turn back now. I'm leaving this point of Scripture. I'm leaving this point with a Scripture to help you at life-altering decision points. It's James chapter 1, verse 15. James says, if any of you, if any of you, that means any of us, Lacks wisdom. I want to show you this. There's two types of wisdom. There's earthly wisdom and there's, there's heavenly wisdom. There is a difference. I've taught on this before a few years ago. But earthly wisdom comes from mankind. It comes from our, our intellect. It comes from our education. It comes from life experience. And there are a lot of smart people in this world. There are a lot of stupid people in this world too. But there's a lot of smart people in this world. <sighs> Fewer smarter and more stupider. That's not a word. I know. But there's a difference between heavenly, earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. 
Because our earthly wisdom is limited. But heavenly wisdom is unlimited. So if any of you lack wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously. That word generously, by the way, one of the definitions of that word is like the third definition down, but it means more than enough. That when you lack wisdom in your life, meaning when you don't know what to do, your mom doesn't know, your dad doesn't know, the pastor doesn't know, then what do I do? I ask God for wisdom. Wisdom. How do I do this? How do I apply this? And he said, I will give more than what you need. Ruth's disappointments and decisions led to, number three, a new dream. Now, the only way you're going to get to the dream part is you got to go through the disappointment and you got to make the right decision at the difficult times and the disappointing times. If you make it through the disappointments, if you make a decision to keep going, you got a chance to live the dream. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now there was a wealthy and influential man in Bethlehem named Boaz, who was a relative of Naomi's husband. Watch this. Naomi and Ruth had suffered much in their life. Now we read this story and we think it's a short amount of time. Their story from the beginning up to this point, there's several years of living, disappointment, And difficult times. They were poor. They were widowed. They were destitute. And now they were living in Bethlehem. So now they're back in Bethlehem. In order to survive, each morning they would get up early and go into the harvest field and gather enough grain for that time or that season in their life. So it was very common in this particular time where the wealthy landowners would instruct his workers or his servants to leave So there was like, it was typical in this time, there would be what I call sweep number one or or harvest number one. Then oftentimes they would come back through the second time and get everything that was missed, the leftovers. But wealthy landowners sometimes would say to their workers and servants, I don't want you to harvest the fields a second time. I want you to leave this behind because we're going to provide for the widows and the poor of our community. So Ruth and Naomi got up each morning and went to the fields of Boaz, who was not broke, who was a wealthy guy, okay? And they had enough grain left over, and that would get them through. But one day, the owner of this field, Boaz, noticed Ruth. Not, it was like, hey, hey, hey kind of moment. That's what that moment was, like, who that girl? That's who that was. It was that kind of moment. He noticed her, and after noticing her, hearing her story, he instructed his workers and servants and said, I want you to leave a little extra behind for Ruth and Naomi. Now, if the story closes right there, we would go, man, that is a great story. They suffered much, and now God brought them back to Bethlehem, and there's this nice guy who just happens to be wealthy, and he's providing for Naomi and Ruth, and they live happily on it. And that would be a great story. But how many of you know that only God can pay back what wasn't fair? Only God can pay you back for what wasn't fair. Because Boaz not only noticed her, but he fell in love with Ruth, and they got married, and Ruth went from a beggar in the fields to an owner of the fields. She went from a difficult and disappointment. Now she is living a dream life. Only God, everybody shout, only God. Only God can turn a broken and a bitter dream into a better and brighter dream. I said it earlier. The dream that you have cannot compare to the dream that God has for you. The blessing that you hope for does not compare to the blessing that God has stored up for you. But you got to make up your mind. I got to get going. And I got to get through this difficult part because if I survive this on the other side is a dream that God has created for me God has got a new harvest field for you 
Could it be that what you thought was dead was just delayed? Could your dream be connected to something bigger than you? God has a way of taking the good of our story to complete his story. Can I give you a little nugget? It's so good. Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, totally unaware of how their story would be connected to the story. So when you read this, Boaz was a type of Christ. Meaning God used Boaz to save Naomi and Ruth. They had no idea how their story would be connected to the story. Watch this. Boaz, if you go back and look at this, was the son of Rahab the prostitute. Who would later be mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ. The Messiah, the Savior of the world. It gets better than that because it also fulfilled the promise that God had made to Abraham centuries before this story that the promised seed would come through Abraham's seed. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. God doesn't forget his people, and God doesn't forget his promises. They may be delayed. You may not think it's right on time, but God is always right on time for his people with his promise. So don't you get up. Don't you give up. Why? Because God doesn't forget his people or his promise. In the midst of Naomi and Ruth's disappointments, God was in the process of rescuing restoring, and even resurrecting their dream. It may not feel like it in your disappointment, but God's not finished with your story. God's dream for us is always bigger and better than ours, but you have to trust his timing. I want to show you something. There's God's will. God's will is to restore. God's will, but there's there's the timing of it. Sometimes... We get so focused on the will of God that we misunderstand, misinterpret, underestimate the importance of the timing of God's will. I'm going to show you this. The timing of God's will and God's will itself are equally important. Equally important. You have to trust not only his will, Watch this. But the timing of his will. It was the timing that made everything right. The only way that Christy and I ended up together, it was the timing of God's will. When I look back, I had to wait four years. I'm like, why? Well, I had to wait on Christy. It's, our story is connected to another story. Who's connected to another story? Who's connected to another story? But ultimately, it ends with the story. So trust God's timing. Trust him that he knows what's best. Would you bow your head, please? Thank you for joining us for this sermon today. If you made the decision to follow Christ, let us know in the comments below or at northwestchurch.tv. If God has encouraged you through this message, be sure to like or share this video with a friend. We'll see you next time.